try to remember to mute yourself uh, if you're not speaking. And I, I did learn a trick that the space bar mutes and unmutes. So it's really easy if you uh, hit the space bar, you can mute and unmute yourself. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna be talking about money matters. And uh, I'm only gonna speak, hey Richie, is it you? <laughs> I'm only gonna I'm only gonna teach a a, a, a few minutes. I, I, this is not gonna be a teaching with a little bit of discussion. My goal is to just introduce the topic and then get a discussion going amongst all of us um, because we we all can learn from one another. <clears throat> and I'm not gonna be addressing personal finances or anything along those lines. My vision for doing this talk was really more about how churches need to understand the importance of financial responsibility and how we as churches and ministries can get better at managing our, res our especially our financial resources. And this is something that I've learned in leading uh, New Day Church now for, uh, uh, you know, I've been a pastor for over 30 years. I've been the senior leader here for over 20 years and have gone through a complete radical transformation of how I view money, how I manage money. And there's, there's definitely things we need to learn and I'm still learning, I'm a student. And then Scott Jones in uh, South Carolina, I've asked to kind of help uh, in the discussion because we work together really concerning the finances of their church in South Carolina and our church. And we've worked on this many times. So he's got some great stories of stuff he's learned over the last 10 years. But the, the one, so Scott and Stephanie was sent, were sent out about 10 years ago to plant New Day South Carolina. And I had been real methodical. They were with me for about seven or eight years with the intention of being sent out. And I really, did everything I could to equip them to lead a church and gave them experience and training and mentored them in every area except the finances. I, we, I had one meeting like a week before they left. And I was like, Scott, I really, I forgot about this. <laughs> you remember that, Scott? Yeah, I do remember that. It was like, um, Laverne and Shirley, back in the day, they said, we're going to teach you how to drive. Here's a can of peas. This is the clutch. Here's a can of green beans. This is the gas pedal. And then off you go. So. <laughs> it was a complete waste of time because I just tried to cram, you know, 10 years of, of learning into an hour. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm trying to improve that with our new churches that we we start and that we need to have an understanding of how to manage money. And, um, you know, church is not a business primarily, but there is a business side of church. And uh, one leader years ago taught me a fantastic lesson is that the business side of church must exist to support the spiritual uh, side of the ministry. And as long as the business, the way the, the church is structured business-wise and the money management exists solely to support the ministry, then it's healthy. But if that gets switched, and that gets switched often, especially in, in, in many churches, uh, the actual spiritual side of the church ends up existing to support and to fund the financial burdens uh, and keeping the building, keeping the programs. And so there's a, it's usually gradual and, and you don't know what's happening until it's done. And that boy, we're, we're constantly doing stuff just to make sure we have enough money or to keep the money flow going. And that's unhealthy when the spiritual exists to support the uh, business. But understanding that we, you need that spiritual, that, you, that business support and the money uh, as a foundation to fund ministry is extremely important. And one thing that I think, in my experience with church leaders, um, 
most of them don't understand how to do it in a healthy way. <clears throat> um, and one thing that really radically transformed my understanding of money and how it relates to church was a number of years ago, I was doing a study, I was actually preaching through Acts 2.42, and you may already know this, but the word koinonia, which is translated almost every time in the Bible as fellowship, means more than just coffee and donuts and more than just relational it means relational fellowship it means community but it also means joint ownership um, it means intimacy and relationship but it also means financial contribution okay and so it, it can be translated um, a gift jointly contributed or a collection and so when they use the word uh, koinonia, when it's trans, it can actually refer to taking a collection. And it was the term, as I understand, in the Greek that was used for when people entered into a business partnership, the portion that they contributed to the business partnership was their koinonia. And um, it can be translated share, as in sharing, but we also use that term in English for uh, when you own a portion of a company in stocks, that's your share, okay? And so the same word usage we find in English because it's based on the Greek idea of uh, joining a uh, joint ownership. And so that just radically transformed my understanding of the financial aspect of of being part of a church in that it's equal to the, the relational fellowship and, um, and that really, if you want relational fellowship, you also need to have the financial commitment and ownership. And we all know that, you know, Jesus said where your uh, heart is, there is your money will be. Where your money is, that's where your real heart is. And so um, investing into something financially both demonstrates your heart's really in it, but also by investing, you actually do put your heart into it. They're linked intimately, and they're linked in the language, but they're also linked in the experience of people. Um, and so I just want to, uh, and that's from Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, that's that koinonia, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And so Acts 2.42 is, the, is really a snapshot definition of the New Testament church. And right in there, in that word fellowship, is not only relational communion, but financial contribution. And so that makes financial contribution an essential aspect of what church is, according to the biblical definition. And, and, and this, I was this way, and I still am. I don't like talking about money. Uh, to the church. I, I, I really don't like it, but I do it because the Bible requires me to it, and I see the importance of it. And, um, and church leaders often shy away from this because they either don't like to be seen as just out for money, uh, or, you know, we, we, we react to abuses in the area of financial manipulation by TV ministries or who, what, you know, maybe a past experience, and you overreact by not talking about it at all, when the proper response is proper and healthy communication. You know, the, the proper response to misuse is not disuse, but proper use. And so let's learn how to talk about money and use money in ministry in a way that's healthy uh, and wholesome. <clears throat> I did want to talk, uh, just put in a plug for our friend David Hicks, who's online. Hey, hey, there he is. Uh, and he wrote a whole book. There's a screenshot. You can buy it on, on Kindle or you can buy it elsewhere. Uh, you can contact David. David, could you give like a two minute? Oh, he's got the, uh, Vince has got the book. A little summary of what you teach in that book, the basis of that book? You're muted, buddy. 
There we go. All yeah, right. sure. Um, I think Vince must have the office copy from when I was in Orangeville. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, I wrote the book because I needed it. Um, despite years of faithful ministry and all those, and doing all the right things and responding to all the right offering calls and all that sort of stuff, um, we reached a point where our finances personally were were disaster. And I said to a friend, out of frustration, um, if my finances are ever going to turn around i'm going to have to write a book about it because there's an old proverb that if you want to own a subject write a book about it because by the time you researched thought about it written it edited it mold it and, and finally put it out there you pretty much own it so what i did was i took i realized that financial struggles were more a reflection of what was going on inside me my premise is that <clears throat> there's no such thing as financial problems it's just that your real problems are showing up in your finances so i took the principles that we uh, derived from the john and carol arnett's ministry and applied it the school of ministry of knowing the uh, knowing god as father who is generous and kind and optimistic and, and full of vision for you the healing of the heart to untangle all the the snarls and knots in our thinking and our beliefs and our experiences and hearing being able to hear god's voice to iron out all the kinks that we get pick up just in church culture we, you know we pick up a lot of conflicting messages um, from a wide variety of experiences and you wind up because of the way we are wired we wind up trying to prove all of them whether they're appropriate for the moment or inappropriate and people wind up with one of those they wind up like one of those old vaudeville guys who would have six poles in their spinning plates on the poles and keeping them all spinning, running back and forth, trying to keep them all spinning and up in the air. And that's what we wind up doing in our finances. And we wind up tripping and falling or being caught up in, in lack or deficit. And uh, so it's, it's not a book about budgeting or saving or investing or any of those things. It's just about why is the subject of money is so conflicted for you and trying to iron those things out it's full of prayers and activations there's even a couple of field trips that people huh. take um because a lot of those beliefs are even embedded in our body language physically so um I, i've spoke i've uh, taught on it a couple times at the school of ministry and it's students really responded well we've I've done weekend seminars at a couple of churches and seen incredible breakthroughs. And more interesting thing is that it's really healing for marriages mm. because finances are such a conflicted area for in marriage. It's, it's the number one marriage buster now. So uh, we see really significant breakthroughs in people's marriages, which is just as rewarding as seeing or more than seeing financial breakthroughs. Wow, that's fantastic. I love how he took the values of partners and integrated it into teaching on finances. And it's, it's really, you know, it's a million books on finances, but to have a, a resource that combines our values with uh, uh, in that, that topic, I think is fantastic. So I highly recommend that. And you can apply the same principles into church finances, as well as, you know, personal finances. And there is a big crossover between the senior leaders financial life and, and mindset and attitude and how the church is run. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Oh yeah. There's a little quip in there when I, when I talk about church finances and I say that, you know, you can kind of gauge the financial health of a church by what kind of car the youth leader drives. <laughs> oh, the youth leader. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> So let's just jump in a little bit of discussion. Scott, what have you learned? And you're now pastoring a church uh, 10 years on, starting from scratch, ground zero. Yeah, so I, I prepared just a little bit to say here. Is that all right? Yeah, um, sure, because actually. I did not go into the ministry uh, in order to have a budget for spreadsheets or to track down receipts or have sound accounting uh, practices. So for me, not, this stuff does not come naturally. And, um, but what I learned is 
uh, you can only use that as an excuse for so long. And eventually you have to take ownership and you have to really uh, learn what you're doing. And the way that I look at having healthy processes, procedures, um, even good software, good tools, uh, staff members to help you out is like, uh, it's like a boxer's stance. So a, a boxer for every movement that he makes, there's a stance, there's his resting stance when he's gonna throw a punch, his feet, his body, everything gets in position so that the impact of that strike is the maximum potential. You know, so he's thinking about attacking and defending. He's thinking about not giving up his height. He's thinking about maximizing his reach. He's thinking about making himself a small target to the enemy. And I think all of these things are, are part of what having a good system in place does. Reducing fatigue, the boxer's stance is going to help him go the distance and not get worn out. And um, you know, recent a recent example is Dan was asking for money for Izmir. And for us, our accounting is in such a good place now that it takes seconds to know exactly where we're at and we have money saved up and we were able to give thousands of dollars. And it was just a question of how many thousands do we want to give? Um, and I think we, we were able to strike. We were already in position. We were already in the stance and we were ready to strike when a need came up. And how many times do we say when we see a need across the kingdom, wow, I wish we could help or we need to pray for somebody with money that could help. But we in the ministry and as churches, I think oftentimes we have the resources coming through our doors, but are we stewarding them and are we getting positioning ourselves so that we're ready to use it? Or is it just, is that potential going to the wayside? Um, so for me, that's a real motivating factor because none of this motivated me at first, but when I think about it that way, it makes me say, oh, this, there's something in this that we can do. Um, just a couple of things. One is uh, having a budget. And we had a budget at first. It was pretty crude. And then some years we took off from having a budget. Uh, in America, if, you've, if you're incorporated, you, you have to have a budget. Um, chances are no one's going to check in on you. But, um, but over time, it was getting that budget refined into something meaningful and getting the right software tools. Um, we use a, an accounting software called Athlos, and it makes it really easy for us to have um, our bank account, our budget, and all of our accounting lines up directly. And we can look at it and see with, within seconds, you know, once it's maintained. But having all of that in place, again, going back to that picture of the stance, um, decisions are easier. There's less time on administration, which leaves more time for ministry. There, you know, the more, that's what matters the most. And there's a greater sense of peace at any given moment regarding when the questions come up about finance. When we had a worse arrangement with our, our bookkeeping and our budget, then decisions were harder. We spent more time making decisions, which is a waste of time, it takes time away from ministry, um, compiling numbers, reinventing the wheel over and over again, and then stress. When someone asks about money or when you need to make a decision, the first response is, I'm already stressed about this. And so having a, a, a budget and all of the back end stuff is really good. And then just one more thing about, um, Cameron was talking about on a Sunday. So there's the, the, the back end side that a lot of people aren't aware of, having that in order 
is a huge benefit um, in the ministry and, and it's great. The, um, the front end is how you communicate to the church. And I agree with Cameron. I think the church needs to hear thank you for joining with us on a regular basis. Church needs to hear some kind of report on this is what we're doing and this is why it's exciting. And it's not exciting if you say we, we paid the staff or we paid the bills because that's assumed. Like you should, you should be doing something inspiring with the money, like giving it away to exciting, you know, the work of the kingdom outside of your own ministry. That's always what people get the most excited about is generosity. And then teaching on giving. And I would say with this, that doctrine is really important, but that it only goes so far because doctrine can be debated. And people can have more than one, often valid perspectives on, on giving. But for me, it comes down to sharing. I, I have an ownership of what motivates me to give. And that's what I, I need to share to cast vision. And what it come down, comes down to, to me is, is, and I say this in the church, if you find a bunch of scriptures that prove that I don't need to give anything anymore, then I, I don't care about that because the idea of not being generous is so uninspiring. I would never want to live my life that way. So if someone said, oh, we've got this doctrine and it's rock solid and we're now all off the hook, we don't have to give anything anymore. I would just say that means nothing to me because I just don't want to live that way. No one's going to write a book about someone who doesn't give. No one's going to make a movie about the man who took care of number one and never looked out for anyone else. What? You know, they did make it. It's called Scrooge. It's called Scrooge. Yeah. And they, they remake it every few years. So maybe that you could be in it. There's no testimony about not giving. No one's going to get up and give a testimony of, about not giving. <laughs> Because um, <laughs> it's not a testimony. It's nothing. And, uh, and so I think to me, it's important to have ownership of what, what is your bottom line that inspires you personally as a leader to want to give and to impart that into the people um, on a regular basis. And every time <clears throat> that we share along those lines, we see a response in people's giving. And it's good for them to give. It's good for them to be generous. It's good for me to give. It's good for me to be generous. Um, so anyway, those are a couple of thoughts. Uh, maybe one more quick one is we need to honor the diversity of gifts. A couple of different lists of gifts. There's one in Romans 12, 6 through 8. It talks about prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation. And it also talks about giving giving with liberality and we need to recognize some people in the body are have a gift of liberality and you know do we make room for the prophetic in the church do we share testimonies about the prophetic do we highlight it do we teach on it well this is in the same list giving is in the same list in another place first corinthians 12 27 through 31 talks about another list of diversity and gifts in it, and it lists um, apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healings, helps, administrations, variety of tongues. But we also need to see that administration is a gift of the spirit. And so we, we need to not create an atmosphere in our churches that discourages people motivated by money and giving or discourages people motivated by administration and organization. And even if we're not good at it ourselves, we need to find a way to honor these gifts and include them uh, so we can have the whole body. Yeah, I think that's excellent. A couple of things that Scott mentioned that I'd like to, to key off of is, um, you know, the vision of the leader and how that vision comes out in the communication. I think you need, a, you need a solid doctrine of how you understand finances and take time to 
to get that in your heart. But like Scott said, doctrine only goes so far. It's really vision. A, a really successful minister taught me years ago that people don't just give money to a good purpose, a good program. They give money to a person they trust that has a good reason. And so uh, it's, it's like, and, and you can become a person they trust if you're the pastor or you're teaching regularly, they, they, they see your relationship, but then you need to have a good reason. And the reason can be anything from, hey, let's grow the church, let's reach our city. But having that vision of generosity and communicating it well, um, a series, a teaching series on giving will be more fruitful than a single message. So from time to time, you need to do a series on giving, whether you like it or not. You need to learn how to teach because people need to learn. Uh, um, the world is screaming about money every day and the church is practically silent on it. And like David said, it's the reason for, uh, it's a, one of the main reasons for divorce in our culture is, is stress over money. And, you know, we need to address the problem before it gets to a crisis So teach you know, you can do classes on, you know, the Ramsey class or other classes, but you need to teach from the Bible and you need to teach uh, sermons. And I tried to work it in. I'm doing a series. We just finished a series on relationships. And one of the messages of how money affects all relationships. And so, and I just said, you know, you introduce money into a relationship and it changes the relationship. And that was the, the, the theme of the message. And I just unpacked that. Another thing uh, Scott said, communicating what you're doing with money. Most churches only, if they do anything, they'll put how much money came in. And that's good. We do that weekly in our bulletin. We put in a report of what last week's offering was. We uh, show what the eight-week eight trending average. And so you take the previous eight weeks, and it gives you an average that that shows you really where you're at at that time. And then year to day average. Those three numbers are in our bulletin every, every Sunday. But every quarter, we produce, this is one we just approved this yesterday. And so it's a quarterly report, not of how much came in, but of how much as a church we gave away and to whom. And so we celebrate giving away let me say this quarter i'm i'm, I'm boasting I'm, i was gonna say i'm not boasting but i am boasting <laughs> i'm not boasting me because i didn't do this I'm, our church we have three congregations in michigan and, and we run it as one uh, uh, church so in just the last three months our three small churches mine gave away over seventy seven thousand dollars That's pretty good. Come on, give me an amen. Seventy-seven thousand uh, dollars that we were able to give away, and so we celebrate that. <clears throat> and my goal is, and and I've reached it. I think all but one year is to give at least twenty percent or more of the general uh, fund away. Twenty percent of all the money that comes in is money given to other ministries, missions, and, and uh, outreach. And we and then we celebrate at that at the end of the year. Yeah, Jungle, jungle Jen, Jen, unmute. There you go. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Thank you so much for sharing this. This is awesome. Um, and Standout Ministries is in a phenomenal place as a ministry financially. That, as you had said before, when the question about um, helping purchase the church building in Turkey, it was yes. I, it wasn't a matter of can we do this it was how much do we do how do we pray through that now i understand that some of us like myself we don't have a church as a body of christ a church building like a um like a church like many of you have we have a nonprofit organization can you speak for a minute to how do we report we're a very generous ministry 
but maybe some of our donors wouldn't quite understand why we gave Andrew Brunson an X amount of dollars to buy that church building because they don't know the whole story. So it's not we're hiding anything. Everything is in our public financial report, but it wasn't something that we let everybody know about because their mindset. We see this in the New Testament. Paul took up offerings to give to the church in Jerusalem because they were suffering a crisis. And so he went to the different churches and took up money for other uh, causes. And so we have the biblical precedent to do this. And I, I agree, you don't, you don't have to give too much detail. And so on that little report, uh, a lot of it is not specific. Uh, you know, we'll just say a okay. nation or we, we have a, we have, if there's a significant amount to a, we break it up into domestic, that's local and national missions and outreaches and then international. And a big category in both of those are other domestic missions and other international. And there's just a lump sum. And so you could just say, you know, supporting church planning or supporting the church in the Muslim world, you know, special needs, something along those lines, but finding a way that communicates and, and really what you're communicating, and this applies to everyone, is a culture of generosity. And I went to a, I went to, I went to a seminar at uh, Wheaton College. So I can now tell everyone I went to Wheaton. That's a joke. <laughs> it was a one day seminar just, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and so it was on church payroll, church finances and, and how to manage finances better. But, um, <clears throat> the guy made a really powerful point. Uh, he said, everything you, you need to talk about generosity. Generosity needs to be the main message not just giving money to the church to meet your needs, but mm. teach on generosity. And that's just one aspect of generosity. And the other thing that he said, and you may, you may have a hard time with this. I actually have a hard time with this, but it's true. All that the, this guy does is travel around uh, the country doing these seminars, which he charges, I think it was like $400 for, for a six hour seminar for church leaders. So he's, a, he's an expert in this. And he said, if you use the word tithe, he said, for most people in our culture, the word tithe means I gave someone something sometime. It's no more specific than, they just think that means giving charity, okay? We, if you have an understand, a biblical understanding of it, it's a very specific, you know, it's 10% to the house of God, if you want to interpret it that way, or to the church or the, or the ministry. But, but when you're outside of the ministry bubble or Bible knowledge for the general person, that's just the church word for charity. Now, I teach tithing a lot. But I also understand if you just use that word, most people don't understand it. And so you can't rely on that. You need to teach generosity and give examples and, and share. <clears throat> um, yeah, Jen. I think another thing we are, as a ministry are trying to do is also teach our donors as something that's in our wave, if you will, is about planting seeds. And our board is very, I mean, that's why we do give generously is because we believe that for every other ministry or organization or church that we give to, we're planting a seed that will reap a harvest with those who are receiving our gift. I don't think a lot of our donors are fully understanding of that, which is why if we were to post such specifics, some of them would come back and say, well, wait a second, that's not what I gave my money for. I gave it for the Amazon mission specifically. So I yeah. think that's another teaching that we as leaders need to include. Yeah, Scott. Can I share? Yeah, I think, Jen, that part of it is that you have this awesome responsibility to pastor these people a little bit 
and put your values into them. And they, they may not think, oh, why did my money? It's like just the money from this ministry, if they'll, they'll get to catch on more and more. This is how we do things. And now the success of all these other ministries is part of the testimony. You know, it's not just the work that you do with your hands, uh, but it's the work you sow into. And so I think that's, that sounds like a great thing. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's building a vision and, and communicating. One, one thing Scott mentioned is developing a budget, and this is for churches and ministries alike. Uh, you should know where every penny has come from and where every penny has been spent, down to the penny. Uh, because if it's off by one cent, then it could be off by $10,000. And I say this from experience, okay? Because I'd compare the numbers and like, oh, you know, it's only off 38 cents. It's close enough. But then I found out there were actually like six different errors that amounted to close to $10,000 of money mismanaged that I thought was just 38 cents. And it didn't show up for months later when it turned out, oh, money I thought was in this account wasn't there. And so you, ha you have to balance your checkbook. <laughs> uh, um, did you wanna say, say something about that, David? Yeah, so the, 38, so the 38 cents was just a net difference between a lot of other chaos going on. <laughs> so chaos. I, I'd like to get back to your point about generosity. Um, you know, when I wrote my book, of course, the t subject of tithing comes up. And every time I've spoken to pastors about the book, the first question is, well, what do you say about tithing? You know, because they're, because they're worried about it, right? Um, and the attitude I take is that, yes, you can do all the Ramsey stuff and all that, and that's all really good housekeeping. But if you've still got issues, that's, all, that's why they come undone. And... Uh, and cultivating uh, an atmosphere of, of generosity is just so important because if you're focused on tithing, 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 well, you've just drawn a line that you, you're either going to pass or fail on. My, yeah. atti my attitude is tithing is a really good start. Tithing is your floor. And from then on, you get to be generous as opposed to, will I be able to tithe? Will I make tithing? Am I kind of, can I, can I negotiate 8% instead? <laughs> or what about the after tax? Or what about with deductions? Um, and if, if your mentality shifts to how can I give, where can I give, this is gonna be fun, as opposed to an obligation to tithe, um, then tithing sort of goes away as, as a personal issue and you get to have, be rolling in the Lord's generosity and having fun and seeing what, how he wants to show love as opposed to am I measuring up? Yeah, that's a huge thing. And learning how to teach on tithing in a healthy way that's not manipulative and it's not a pass fail grade and, and understanding that people that just coming in, you know, they need an on ramp. And if you say, hey, the, the cost of membership is 10% of your gross income, <laughs> you, you're just putting like, that's a big price tag. Uh, but if, what I do is I teach uh, a, 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 a proportional giving, give a proportion of your income and believe for um, exponential return, okay? And so if you're new, start out at 1%, but have the goal of getting to that biblical standard of 10% and then challenge yourself and be generous above and beyond and then share testimonies of people that do tithe and, and you know, those testimonies that are just out of the park and life-changing. Testimonies really do work. And those are the ways that we can communicate vision as well. Yeah, that's where the fun is. Yeah, that's where the fun is. Yeah, Scott. Well, I was just going to say, I think for me, it was probably the fifth time teaching on it that it felt like more frictionless and smooth. The first couple times, it felt really awful because it's intense. And um, but I realized one time uh, when I was reading through uh, the Book of Genesis <clears throat> that the first murder in human history came right after the first offering. So, 
was the result of the first <laughs> offering. And I was like, okay, we just need to acknowledge that this is an intense issue. <laughs> and, um, and once we acknowledge that, it gets a little bit easier to talk about. So. I, I never thought of it that way. That's great. <laughs> All right, one other point that I found has helped us as a church significantly, I should have had an offering envelope here. Uh, our envelopes, our website, our uh, iPad kiosks, our uh, every, everywhere we take money in, and, and you need to have, first of all, you need to have many ways to give. So we, when we take an offering, we put a slide up on the screen, and then we have a little card in each seat pack, a, a, a pocket, that says ways to give. Because, listen, if, this really hit me as when a young woman, she was about 30, and she came to me, and she said, I need to write a check, because this institution only takes a paper check. She said, I've never written a check. Could you show me how to do it? This was a college educated 30 year old woman and she didn't know how to write a check. And I realized, oh my word, at that point, checks were the primary way we received offerings. And so I said, we need to change this. And so people, most people under 30 have never written a check. Many of them have never seen a paper check. And so if you don't have ways to give electronically, you are telling people you don't want their money. So you need to have text to give, you need to have an app, you need to have online giving, you need to take paper checks because there's some people that want to write out a little memo. <laughs> it's right down to the penny. And then some people still put in $100 bills, you know, or $20 bills. And, and there's, that's why I still pass the plate because it never fails that some people will just reach into their pocket and throw in 20 bucks. Um, you know, and that adds up. Um, so have multiple ways to give and communicate that every service or a, as often as you can. But I, we also have the preferred way. And for us, the preferred way is go through your bank or credit union and set up bill pay. And the reason we prefer that is it doesn't cost us 3% and it doesn't cost you 3%. There's no fee. In America, it's called bill pay. Other countries, it's called different things where the bank or the institution sends out the payment automatically. Um, and it's just over half of our money comes in uh, electronically throughout the week uh, and not in the offering. Most offering the plates are empty and I'm happy because they're giving other ways. I have been at many churches uh, where when they take the offering, they wait while people go back in line and use the kiosk. And I, I don't want to be openly critical of it, but I really don't understand that because it takes a long time for people one at a time to slide their card through. And I think they don't have to use the kiosk then. That kiosk is available before and after services and you can use the online giving throughout the week. When we pass the plate, that's for the envelopes. So have multiple ways to give, and then on your envelopes and on your website and whatever app you use, have a menu. And let me just give this illustration. If you went into a restaurant and they only had one thing to pick from, you know, meatloaf. You know, well, it's meatloaf or nothing, honey. Okay, we'll get meatloaf. And you go back the next week and there's meatloaf. You're not gonna go back to that restaurant. Successful restaurants, it, I go to restaurants, I'm like, why is this menu so big? They're pages and pages. Because the more options you give, the more likely people will buy something, okay? This really works. And so churches can't just have tithes and missions. You need to have a well thought out, options not too many we have about six or eight and we change them up from time to time and, and so this is my tithe and then you know these are the missions we support and they can indicate how much uh, scott i saw you raise your hand earlier 
Yeah, it was just a small point, but in, in regards to having more than one way to give, we were at a meeting last night and we wanted to give and they only did cash or check. We had neither. Um, in our heart, we already wanted to give, but they didn't have that. And so now the chances of us looping around and finding a way to give, they just start to go down. And I think that's the thing is people in our church, often they want to be generous and it's just removing the obstacles. And when we added text to give online payments, we had to pay money for certain services that we used, but the, the in, increase more than made up for any additional cost. Every time we've added that avenue, the offerings go up because people decide in their heart, they want to do it right now. And if they have to wait, they might not do it at all. Yeah. They'll forget. I never carry cash or checks anymore. I, 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 I need to have an electronic or a, a debit card. And that's just the way most people are. Just and yeah, the, the fee, just forget about the fee. Just forget about it. You know, yeah. You put I, on I, I, underneath, we just put a little check box that they can check. And it'll say, if you like, for automated uh, extra additional fee to be taken out to cover processing costs check here and everybody does it and it's it's usually amounts to just a few dollars yeah that's that's an option with most thing most uh, uh, digital giving is that you can have the donor pay the fee or you can eat the fee for us it's simpler uh, for a church we just ignore that and we we eat the fee but it, like you said, it just amounts to, a, uh, it's a very small amount overall. All right, any questions or other comments about this general topic? Can I just make a comment while people are thinking of their amazing questions? Um, uh, when we started out, a chart, we had our chart of accounts. Does everyone know what that is? It's kind of your your little list and map of all the funds and categories that you divert, like a building fund, or you want to put money in towards worship team, or children's ministry, salaries, all of those types of things. When we started out, we had inherited from a, kind of an older software program, their automatic chart of accounts, which had about 100 or 150 categories, that's what it felt like. And we that was a friction for us, and we started to narrow it down. We moved to QuickBooks, um, but QuickBooks is really difficult for nonprofits because they don't do fund accounting. And, um, and we were talking to a consultant, so we paid four or $500 to talk to a consultant to learn how to use QuickBooks more effectively for us. And one of the things that came out is he looked at our chart of accounts and he said, why do you have all these categories? He said, you know, things like your telephone and your cable, put those under one item. And if you need to know what you spent on cable, just do a search for the, the provider's name. Don't create a, a line for everything. And he helped us shorten our chart to about 20 or 25 things. And, um, and that made it began to make it really easy. And then when we switched to Aplos, which is a fund accounting software that we pay for every month, like our chart of accounts lines up exactly with our budget. That's what the consultant said. Make your budget as simple as it can be and your chart of accounts lines up exactly with it and there's nothing extra in it at all and um so sometimes getting a professional to help look at things can be worth it because again over the years it's going to save hours of time that then is free for ministry or whatever else is more of a priority so since you've already worked with that person, if they're still in business, is that some information you could share with all of us? Because obviously we would rather have somebody who comes from a reputable source than just picking somebody randomly. 
Yeah, I could share his name. Um, I don't think there was anything magical about this one person. Um, it, in fact, well, he gave us the advice to make our chart of accounts more concise. So that was the one thing that really impacted us. And then what we found out through conversation, he was an expert on QuickBooks. And it came down to, I said, but this is what we want to do. And he said, well, QuickBooks will never do that. And then I said, well, thank you. I think we're going to look for something else. And that was it. So I don't know if there's anything magical about that one person, but I think expert, there have got to be a million experts out there that can say something. Um, and, but we knew what we wanted to do. And a lot of people do not understand nonprofits or clergy, even our payroll company. We were with a, a, trying to set up with a major payroll company, but they had no understanding of how the clergy works in America. And we found a specialized company called Clergy Tax Net. And, um, and we pay them and they understand everything. They file all of our reports and they're really good. So I think it's looking for the companies that understand nonprofit. And I, I would say that in every church, or you probably have friends or associates that know how to manage money. And, and on my board of directors, one of the qualifications is that they need to be successful business people uh, to be on my board. And the board is for fiduciary responsibility, financial and, gov and government reporting oversight, as well as spiritual. But for the fiduciary, I want them to be people that know how to manage their successful businessmen. And so they know, uh, one, they have a lot more money than I have. And they're not afraid of numbers. And so you need to find people like that. And a lot of times those people are quiet. The wealthiest people don't talk about their money. They don't flaunt it. And so you get to need you need to know you need to learn how to discern them and then and then say, hey, I'd like your advice about this. And and what Scott said about business accounting, which is uh profit and loss versus fund accounting, which is how nonprofits work. They're, they're two different forms of accounting. And some people that know profit loss accounting, they don't have any understanding of fund accounting. Uh, and so, and that's what pro, uh, nonprofits use. So you need to find someone that's familiar. It's like, are you familiar with fund accounting? Have you ever worked with nonprofits? Nope. Do you know anybody that does? <laughs> you can still learn stuff from people that uh, are business people, but it is a different it is a different accounting system. Uh, and, the, and and churches and ministries are often sloppy with money, and we need to be good stewards. And um, <clears throat> again, at this seminar, I went to there was a young woman that um, now works for this ministry. But she worked for 15 years for big companies, Fortune 500 companies. And when she came into ministry, she shared how she was dumbfounded and shocked at the practices of churches and ministries, that they were not only not wise, but they were not legal. Uh, she, she was really shocked. And they were, they were, actually morally inappropriate to the point where there could have been legal action, even though the churches were motivated by good intent. And the one example I'll share is like, they would pay, a church would pay uh, one pastor more because that pastor had more kids and therefore had greater need than another pastor who didn't have any kids or maybe only had two kids, okay? And so basing how much you pay someone and how many kids they have is illegal in America <laughs> because it's inappropriate. It's not based on their level of education or their experience or anything tangible. And so, <laughs> I mean, she was like, a company would be sued 
and have to pay a serious fine if Amazon did that or something like that. So, so we need to be shrewd. You know, the sons of the world are more shrewd in this generation than the sons of light, Jesus said. And we need to come, we need, in some ways, we need to get to the standard of, of let's be better than businesses, right? But let's certainly not be less uh, upright with our finances than, than businesses. We only have three minutes left, uh, and we'd like to pray. Uh, if there is a, somebody that has a question, we could take that. Otherwise, we'll end in a, a few minutes of prayer. Question or comment? Dave? Um, I just sent you a couple of uh, links. Um, one is the link to the um, platform that Scott was talking about, and another one to a link for Canadian churches called the Canadian Council of Christian Charities. They're consultants in this whole area, and they're really impressive in terms of the value that they, that they offer their members. So I sent That's just right. the, those to you, but I'm not sure how or where to post those. Yeah, so they're in the chat if anybody wants those. And then there's um, there's a, also there in the U.S. There's a equivalent, which is an event uh, EFCC or something like that. It's the Evangelical Fellowship of Christian Churches. It, I can't, I don't remember it offhand, but it's it's a uh, it's an association that uh, ensures churches and ministries uh, operate on a standard of excellence. Um, and so it just takes a little Googling to find that. But there's the link, ccc.org, ccc.org, and the Applos is a great app. Cameron, I think that might have been just private between you and David. Is that right, David? It's not. Yeah. So <laughs> oh, okay. If we it's can put private. it to everyone in the chat. Um, okay, I'll do that. I haven't figured out how to chat publicly there. We're all learning. We're all growing. We've got David Hicks coming down like in a week, a week from today, right? And Charmaine, we're so excited to have you guys. I just shared it to everyone in the chat. Um, so I would say if anyone has questions about nuts and bolts, like I would be available. I assume Cameron, you'd be available too if anyone wanted to email a uh, quick question about something afterwards because I do think and maybe everyone here is here because they already like this stuff but for me I did not like this stuff I liked it when it was done and out of the way but I could not stand to sit down and do it and um, so I, I was always looking for answers and help so I don't know, I'm not an expert, but I'd be happy if anyone wanted to ask a question through email, just to ask. So, and I'll stick my, my address in the, this to everyone. See sure, now to everyone. To learn. Listen, uh, this is a great testimony. We wanna pray for Andrew Brunson. His trial is, his next hearing is on the 12th. This is, he's the pastor in uh, Izmir, Turkey, that's been imprisoned under false charges. But Partners in Harvest raised close to $150,000 in six weeks. Yeah. All right. And Partners is not known to have a lot of money. Let me tell you, I know how much money we have and don't have, and we need a lot more. But when there was a clear need communicated effectively and the way we communicated is because it couldn't be on social media we were like we need to call people or email people directly but it was all done through personal contact that's the best way to raise money and when we made the decision and i was in the group that made the decision to go for it we own there was only fifty thousand dollars that the Brunsons already had. And we said, let's offer 300,000 for the building. They were able to get it down to 285,000. And in six <coughs> partners, along with the Brunsons personal network, uh, raised the full amount. They were able to secure the building. We're still, some of the money is still in transition. So the building is now Basically, you could say in trust, um, but in, in a matter of six weeks, partners stepped up 
and uh, and we did it. And so that's just a great example of what can be done if you have a clear vision, a genuine need, it's communicated properly, and you and and and, and it works. So, so let's pray for Andrew, and then Scott, could you close in prayer as well? Yeah, Father, we just pray specifically. We thank you that uh, the financial needs for that the church in Izmir you have provided and are providing as the money continues to come in, um, Lord. But we pray for Andrew's freedom. We pray that he would be set free, uh, that he would not go back to prison, and I pray that he would also be freed from the house arrest, either uh, moving out of the country until the hearing is completely settled. Uh, Father, pray for his safety but freedom in Jesus' name that you change, turn the heart of the judicial system and the government in Turkey uh, and let justice be done. Father, we pray for divine justice that you would not only free him, but you would uh, stand up and everything that he has lost, everything that the enemy has stolen, you would return uh, uh, at least sevenfold, if not 30, 60, 100fold in Jesus' name. And Scott, could you just close this? Yeah, Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your, your kingdom and, the, and the, all that you're doing, Lord, and the ministries represented here and throughout all of Partners in Harvest. And Lord, we just uh, intercede on behalf of Partners in Harvest and ask uh, for an increase, even in financial provision, to that we would be able to realize and accomplish the things that you're uh, tasking us with and placing on our hearts. Lord, I just ask for a greater um, accountability with our accounting, our processes, um, um, all of the nuts and bolts. I ask for uh, people to be sent, administrators, bookkeepers, people with know-how to come into the churches. We pray for more gifted and knowledgeable people that can get the job done to support the work of the ministry so that each ministry can go out and accomplish really what they're called to do and be freed up from having this area in any sort of chaos. We just say, thank you for your grace and we bless you in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. Amen. Well, this meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>